All right, so hello and welcome to the Coalition for Colleges Making College Affordable panel. My name is Derek Terrell and I'm the Director of Member Engagement here at the Coalition. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the Coalition, we're more than 150 colleges and universities with a proven commitment to access, affordability, and student success. And together we provide a set of tools called My Coalition to help students learn about, prepare for, and attend college. Uh, coalition schools demonstrate their commitment by providing responsible financial aid to graduating students in a timely manner, including those who have been historically underrepresented in higher education. Uh, we work together as a membership to share best practices and move higher education forward toward greater access and equity. So here are the average graduation rates for coalition member schools and at about 80%, the six year graduation rates taken on average for coalition schools are about 20% higher than the national average. Uh, it's really important for you to look at graduation rates when thinking about overall value and affordability, which our panel is about today, uh, because you want to make sure that your investment will result in that degree. Um, so my coalition is much more than an application. It's actually designed to engage students as early as ninth grade by providing the locker, a free unlimited storage space for documenting what you experience and, and accomplish throughout high school. And it's mobile friendly and accepts any kind of file. Uh, whether it's a college list, a draft of an essay or a resume, uh, photos, videos, or any kind of documents or projects that, that you're proud of, uh, the locker is an ideal place to keep those files. Um, and tapping into all the coalition has to offer is very easy. You can simply go to mycoalition.org and create an account. And of course, don't forget to follow us on Instagram at Coalition for College. So now we're going to jump into our panel on making college affordable. Uh, we'll go over some of the basics of financial aid and affordability, as well as tips on making college affordable. And then we'll leave about the last 30 minutes, as I said, for questions pulled from the Q&A. Um, so now I'll go ahead and allow our panelists to introduce themselves. And we'll go ahead and start with Brent. Well, good evening, everybody. I'm Brent Benner from, from the University of Tampa. Good evening. I'm Kelly Kane from the University of Pittsburgh. Good evening, friends. I'm Mary Meyer from Haverford College. Hi, everyone. Jared Whitney from Caltech in Pasadena, California. All right. Thank you so much. So making college affordable for students from all backgrounds has always been important for coalition schools and affordability is important now more than ever, especially amidst the pandemic and financial uncertainty. Um, so Kelly, can you kick us off uh, with some key vocabulary um, in terms that students and families should know? Absolutely. So as you're starting into the um, college admissions and financial aid process, here's just a few things that we want to make sure you understand. First is the cost of attendance. A lot of times we hear about tuition or maybe tuition and fees, and perhaps you hear about tuition fees, room and board. But the cost of attendance is really that total cost it takes to attend an institution. So it does include the tuition, room, board fees, but it also takes into account your books, your supplies, your transportation and personal expenses. So definitely take a look at that full cost of attendance when you're considering schools because sometimes that transportation cost, getting back and forth to school is not something you originally thought of, but definitely is something you should consider um, when making that final decision. The second uh, thing we want to talk about is your expected family contribution or your EFC. You'll hear people say EFC a lot. That's your expected family contribution. And this is what um, a college or university expects the family in order in order to be able to contribute to one year of their um, college bill. Um, the EFC will be calculated based on information that you'll provide on the FAFSA, which is something we're going to talk about in a couple more slides. Your demonstrated financial, financial need is just a simple math problem. We're going to take the cost of attendance. We're going to subtract out that expected family contribution, and that is your demonstrated need, and that is what colleges and universities will use in order to um, try and make that college affordable for you to attend. The last term, need blind, is more on the admission side, but it wraps into the whole financial aid conversation. This is a policy schools use where they do not take your um, any of your financial information into consideration waking, when making the admissions decision. The University of Pittsburgh, for instance, is a need blind school school. We, can, we make all of our admissions decisions without having any idea of your financial background. 
Um, and so therefore, how much a family can contribute does not go into those decisions. Awesome, thank you so much, Kelly. So you spoke about financial e need and aid. Um, so Jared, can you tell us a bit about uh, financial aid and what it actually consists of? I think this is a great kind of starter for this conversation because too often, if you're the first in your family to go through college, if you even hear the term financial aid, you automatically think, at least I did in my family situation, you automatically think of just loans. When in fact, a financial aid package could consist of scholarships, grants, loans possibly, and even work study. And these four components are pretty significant as you start looking at your financial aid options at different institutions. So tonight's panel will go through each grouping and give you more information on what the difference is between all these different options within financial aid. Awesome, so now that we know what fin financial aid consists of, um, scholarships, loans, grants, and work studies, um, we'll go ahead and let you all uh, give some of your advice um, and insight on these various forms of financial aid. Okay, um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about scholarships. Scholarship is uh, money given to students for some type of characteristic, whether it be academic, merit, um, it could be for some type of special talent, uh, musical, artistic, athletic, etc. cetera. Um, we often refer to scholarships as gift aid because this is money that you do not need to pay back. So one of the pieces of advice we wanna give students is start even before your senior year. There's a lot of places outside of colleges and universities that provide scholarships that can be sent, the money can be sent directly to the college or university of your choice. And that could, that money can be used to take off um, your overall bill. Um, all different places, churches, organizations, a lot of times parents, employers, um, will give scholarships. Here are two different um, websites that are very helpful um, in their reliable sources. Now you just have to do a little due diligence sometimes, which is why we, we offer these two sources because there are places out there that say they're scholarships. You just want to make sure it's a credible source when looking for those scholarships. The great thing about grants is that similar to scholarships, it's free money. So it's a type of financial aid, but where it comes from will depend on the type of program or the state you live in. So similar to scholarships, it's gift aid. You don't have to pay it back. But what's interesting is that they're sometimes hidden, meaning you have to really ask and dig, dig a little deeper to find out from research where you can get some grants. So a common place that you may not even be aware of is your own state can offer grants. And those grants could be based on your GPA, could be based on maybe even a county in part of your state. So I'm from upstate New York originally, and I received what's called the New York State TAP Award, Tuition Assistance Program. And then now I'm in California working for Caltech. We have called the Cal Grant Award. And actually in the state of California, there's a few different levels of Cal Grant based on your academic performance while in high school. There's typically an additional application check with your high school counselor about how to apply for it or just go online, look up state grants and you'll usually get a whole listing of grants you can apply for. So loans, very simply, that's money that you borrow and you have to pay back over a period of time. Um, most American college students will take out loans to help pay for college, nearly 70% uh, based on the most recent data. And loans can be scary, but they are not a bad thing. Um, it's just important that you understand what the terms are. So for federal direct loans, um, there are two types, uh, but both types have a fixed interest rate for the entire life of the loan. And they can either be subsidized or unsubsidized loans. And these differ in a couple of of important ways. A subsidized loan, um, federal loan is based on financial need. And a really great benefit of this is that the federal government will pay the interest that accrues while the student is in school. And then upon graduation, there is a grace period before the student has to begin repayment. So this is a great benefit, saves you a little bit of money. 
An unsubsidized federal loan is not based on financial need at all, and it's available to anyone who files the FAFSA. The student can choose to pay the interest while they are in school or defer that interest and add it to the principal amount of the loan upon graduation. Um, some institutions may also have special loan programs or policies for students. For example, at Haverford, we don't include loans for families with incomes under $60,000 a year. And then we actually cap the student loan expectation at just $3,000 per year for any of our students who qualify for financial aid. Um, and many other institutions have similar um, and, and generous loan policies like that. So that's a good, good question to ask. And I'm going to speak a little bit about work study and also talk about uh, part-time work on campus too, because I think this is a, another way that you can earn income. But work study, whether you're eligible to work study is really determined by your EFC, as Kelly had mentioned before, your expected family contribution, which is determined by completing the FAFSA, which we're going to talk about here in a moment. But um, the, if, if you are eligible for work study, I strongly urge you to do it because, quite frankly, um, a lot of jobs on campus are really exclusively for work study students. And let me give you an example. Here at the University of Tampa, if you want to work in the Department of Athletics, you get a part-time job, you have to be a work-study student. Likewise with the library and, uh, and residence life. It's just important to do it early. You can actually uh, secure that job before you can uh, come on campus in many cases. And uh, especially now, you can do a Zoom interview and, and the like. And uh, you really need to do it that first week you're on campus. Otherwise, because camp campus jobs fill up pretty quickly. And it's a great thing to do, work study, because uh, you can make, first of all, you can build your resume and you can make some great connections with people you work with. In fact, I was, uh, ironically enough, today I was training a new admissions counselor who I hired, and she was a work study student for admissions. And, you know, we saw her great work, her work ethic, and it ended up becoming a full-time job working for the university. And it all started because of her work study. And then you can also get, even if you're not work study eligible, you can still get jobs on campus, like our development office, our financial aid office, and our office of admissions hires non-work study students. But uh, I do wanna talk briefly about work off campus because this is a great way to earn extra income and perhaps being able to fund travel abroad. Um, if you go to uh, a college that's in a small college town, a lot of times it's, it's pretty easy to get part-time work because those small college towns really rely on the students that go to that college uh, for, for taking on a lot of their part-time jobs. And likewise, in large cities, um, I went to the University of Louisville and it was pretty easy to get a job back in the day. And uh, you know, in Chicago, New York City, here in Tampa, it's very easy for students to get uh, part-time work and earn significant money. And you can also, um, a lot of times people forget this, but you can get jobs, particularly your junior and senior year, that are related to your major and very important on your resume. And I'll give you two quick examples with my own kids. My oldest daughter was a marine science student who knew how to dive, and she got a uh, job working for a marine lab about half an hour from campus and uh, earned very good money, well above minimum wage, and it was an incredible thing to put on her resume. And my current, my youngest daughter is a cybersecurity major here at Tampa, she's a senior. She's got a, a job that pays $18 an hour working for this cybersecurity company, doing some incredible things. Hack, she's actually hacking other countries uh, for military intelligence. So, um, and she can do most of it while on campus. So if you're creative and really look at various things available, uh, it can be a great source of income. Thanks so much for that, Brent. Um, and you had mentioned something called the FAFSA. Um, so can we switch gears a little bit now, Kelly? And um, can you talk about how students and families can access financial aid in the forms that they'll need? 
Absolutely. I, I did want to jump in and say something um, uh, with what Brent had just said about work study. I will say that I was a work study student at the University of Pittsburgh in their Office of Admissions and Financial Aid. And I just reached my 21st uh, year working in the Office of Admissions and Financial Aid. So those work study jobs really do help build careers. So I, I just want to do a shout out to the work study students out there. Um, we did, uh, several of us mentioned this thing called the FAFSA, um, which is the free application for federal student aid. Um, this is a form we really encourage all families to fill out, regardless of whether you think you're eligible for financial aid or not, because this, you know, a lot of times you'd be surprised what you are eligible for, and it really, it's a free form. Just make sure you go to that FAFSA.gov site, because there, again, there are sites out there that, that might say, hey, I'm going to help you fill out the FAFSA, just pay this fee. You don't need to pay it. It is 100% free. Um, we definitely encourage you to file it. And, and why? why? Why should you file this? Besides the fact that, um, you know, you really could be eligible for money. It's the, it's the federal and state grant money that we talked about where it's that free money. You do not want, um, you want to find as many sources of that money where you can, um, you don't have the payback after you graduate. An important date tomorrow, the FAFSA opens. So if you are a senior or a family of a senior or helping a senior, tomorrow that FAFSA opens and we recommend you file it as soon as possible. Um, there are, there's this thing called prior prior is a term you might have heard thrown out there. Um, the FAFSA used to have to be filed in the spring of a senior's um, senior year, but now they moved it back to this October and you actually use uh, two years prior tax returns. So for students that are applying for the fall 2021 term, you get to use the fall or the 2019 tax information. So you don't have to wait around to file your taxes. You get to use last year's tax returns. So definitely fill out the FAFSA. All right, awesome. Yeah, so the FAFSA is definitely something that you all should look into and, and fill out, especially for the seniors. Um, but can you tell us about some of the other uh, financial aid forms that students might have to fill out, Jared? Oh, I think you're on mute. Good call. Uh, so sometimes it can get very confusing when you're looking at all the different colleges. And I always recommend first, set up an Excel spreadsheet for each college you're interested in for the admissions applications and their deadlines, then set up a separate Excel just for financial aid forms that those colleges might require. Almost every single university and college in America will require the FAFSA because that's required for receiving any type of federal funding or assistance. Whereas the CSS profile is widely used mostly by just private institutions. So check with the school's requirements to see if they do require it. If they do require the CSS profile, it's very likely they'll use what's called an institutional methodology to figure out your financial need, which basically goes into a little bit more depth of your financial situation beyond what the FAFSA information will provide. So it is very important if it is a CSS profile school to fill out that form in addition to the FAFSA that you will definitely have to fill out. Unfortunately, there is a fee, so the school uh, the profile itself usually requires a $25 fee for the first college a form is submitted to, and I think it's about $16 after that. You can request fee waivers, so that's good news. There are a lot of students who get fee waivers. But again, the CSS profile just asks for more in-depth information to help us better understand your family's assets. So definitely take the time to do so. And similar to the FAFSA, it will also ask for the prior prior year information. And as this slide suggests, it starts opening up October 1st. So you can start submitting that as a senior right now. Awesome, so we've, we've covered the FAFSA and the, the TSS profile, which are the two main financial aid forms that people usually talk about. But Mary, can you let us know about um, some other financial aid forms that families should be aware of? 
Absolutely. Um, as Jared said, it's always important to check the policies and requirements for each institution to which you plan to apply, um, because some may have their own financial aid forms, um, particularly for special scholarships, uh, merit aid, things like that. Uh, other institutions like those that require the CSS profile will use a service called IDOC, which allows families to submit tax returns and other documents only one time and then have those documents securely sent to multiple institutions that use this IDOC service. Um, and there is not a fee for families to participate in that, although, as Jared said, there is a fee for filling out the CSS profile form. Um, Another important note for many families is that non-custodial parents are generally expected to complete financial aid forms as well. Um, but there are cases where it may be unsafe or impossible for families to provide that non-custodial information. So just know that this requirement can be waived. Um, feel free to reach out to the school that you're applying to to find out their procedures for requesting a waiver for that. Um, but that is not an insurmountable obstacle. Um, and in all cases, remember that just as we are clearly real people appearing on your screens this evening, um, we also have real people working in our admission and financial aid offices, and they are very much here to help you through the process. So do not hesitate to reach out to schools with questions particular to your individual family situation. Awesome. So that was a pretty quick and uh, yet very thorough, I think, overview of financial aid. And now we're going to have our panelists give us some tips on affordability and financial aid. Um, so we'll start actually right where we left off with Mary. Oh, yes. Okay, great. Um, so I think we all know that college is pretty expensive. I'm sure that's why you're all here tonight. Um, and the sticker price for colleges uh, and universities can be downright shocking and scary. Um, however, a college education is is not the same thing as buying a car or a computer. Your college degree is truly an investment that will continue to benefit you for the rest of your life. Um, most adults will have six to 10 different jobs during their working lives, and a four-year college degree puts you in the best position to respond to an ever-changing job market. And it will help you to earn much more money, on average $1.3 million more over the course of your working life. So beyond the sticker price, so Mary did uh, mention that some of these sticker prices sometimes look a little overwhelming. Um, so don't take a, a college or university off your potential list because you're taking a look at that sticker price and saying, I am never going to be able to afford that. Um, some of the most expensive colleges give some of the most generous financial aid. Um, I want to give you an example of something we do at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, we have, we just developed a, a new program within the past uh, two years called our Pitt Success Program. Um, and one of the things that, that we did notice at the University of Pittsburgh, if, if you Google us, we come up as usually one of the most expensive public schools in the country. Um, we, it was national news we did not want to make. Um, we had a new provost that started in 2000. Um, September of 2018 and in February of 2019, the university announced its largest infusion of financial aid dollars in Pitt's history. We said, this is not gonna work. Um, we started this Pitt Success Program and uh, we now match dollar for dollar any kind of Pell, the, the federal Pell Grant. So when you fill out that FAFSA, um, it's determined if you're eligible to receive this federal, federal Federal, federal Pell Grant, um, which we said earlier was free money, and the university said if the, the federal government's going to give you $6,000 in a Pell Grant, we're going to give you $6,000 free money to match it, and that is before 
we consider you for any other merit-based scholarships or institutional grants. So um, that's just one example. Colleges and universities are really wanting to make school um, affordable for students. So, so please don't be scared of that sticker price. Do, do just a little bit of investigating and, and you might be pleasantly surprised to see what you can afford. That was really great, Kelly. Um, it seems like there are a lot of schools, especially coalition schools, who are trying to make college affordable. Um, and I know we had talked earlier about demonstrated financial needs. So Mary, can you tell us a little bit about uh, finding affordable options uh, at coalition schools even? Absolutely. Um, so just as Kelly said, you don't want to make assumptions about affordability based on just the sticker price. Don't make assumptions about the institution's financial aid policies either. Um, I recommend that you ask a couple of key questions for all the schools that you are considering. The first and most important is, does this school meet the full demonstrated financial need for all of its admitted students. So that means will they provide, will the institution provide financial aid for you um, in that full amount between the cost of attendance and your expected family contribution, right? Um, unfortunately, not every school in the country meets the full need of uh, the full demonstrated need of all applicants. And so that is really a critical question to ask upfront at the very beginning. I also think it's helpful to ask um, what the typical makeup of that financial aid package is. So how much of your financial need is being met by loans and work study versus how much is gonna be covered by grant and scholarship, that kind of free money that everybody's talking about. Um, it's also helpful to note whether or not an institution offers merit aid. Um, that is, you know, a scholarship that's not necessarily based on financial need, but may be awarded in addition to need-based aid because of academic excellence or special abilities in music or athletics. Some schools offer this, some schools don't. And so that's another good question to ask. Another uh, important approach to affordability is to consider some of the wonderful public colleges and universities that will offer you in-state tuition. Haverford is uh, in uh, Pennsylvania, right outside of Philadelphia. So I happen to know that in-state tuition at Pitt School of Nursing is $18,000 less than the out-of-state tuition. So that in-state tuition can really um, make even expensive options much more affordable for families. Awesome, thank you, Mary. So we've kind of talk, talked about meeting the demonstrated financial need, but we also know um, that every family's situation and their finances are, are very different. So Jared, can you um, talk to us a little bit about how uh, families can find out more about their particular uh, situation at some of the schools? I think what's important here is go back to that concept about sticker price, because far too often families, and including mine, I was the first of my family to go to college, all my parents did was look at the cost of the school and say, we couldn't afford it. And back in my day, we didn't have the luxury of what's called a net price calculator to help families walk through it. So I have a game for you all tonight. You as parents and family members and students come together, go to the schools you're looking at and every college in America is mandated by federal law to have what's called a net price calculator somewhere located definitely on their financial aid site, mostly on admission sites as well to help families get a somewhat quick estimate at the cost based on what the family could afford. So there'll be some basic questions that you'll find in more detail in the FAFSA and profile form, but you can do it pretty quickly, less than a half an hour, and usually less than 15 minutes if you have all your, your tax information in front of you. They'll ask some simple questions about the parents' assets and the family situation and spit out a quick number for you. And you can do the net price calculator long before you even apply for college. In fact, it's completely separate from the admissions and official financial aid process because it's just a way to help families get a better sense of the net price for that institution. Now, every school has their own net price calculator and I can guarantee you that many schools use different versions of a price calculator. The college board itself also have a net price calculator to help families kind of walk through and understand the cost and affordability. And there's a new tool that about 65 or so colleges are using called My Intuition, which is even a quicker estimate. You can usually do it in less than three minutes 
to help your family better gauge the cost of this. So I encourage all the families listening tonight just to go to each school site, look at their net price calculator to get a better estimate of how much it might be affordable before you decide whether or not to apply based on a sticker price. And I'll tell you that I always say go to the school sites because there are some third party companies that sell what's called aggregators that will try to match everybody's net price calculator. So you put it in one time for 50 different schools. Some of those work well, some don't work so well. So I would trust the own school's net price calculator if you're gonna do some of that fact checking. Thank you, Jared. Um, so I know that Brent over at the University of Tampa and, and his team do such a great job um, really working with families and talking to them about admissions and financial aid. So uh, can you tell us a little bit about other resources or things that families should look for um, in regards to financial aid? Sure. Yeah, and I do want to reiterate what Jared just said, because I think net price calculators are incredibly underutilized by families. And you've got to remember, universities, we spend a lot of time and a lot of money making sure that ours is accurate. Because if I have a student who's a junior in high school and goes on there in June and sees that this is how much the University of Tampa is gonna cost, and then they get their financial aid package in November, and it's not close to what that said, then that's, there's something really wrong with that. So we spend a lot of time really making sure it's accurate. I think people are very skeptical of how accurate they are. But I can assure you, most are very accurate. But anyway, uh, with respect to these other resources, um, you know, a lot of them are, are out there and they're, I mean, they're, they're right in front of you there and I know you all can read. But uh, there's two things I wanna uh, focus in on and that I, uh, again, I think are kind of underutilized uh, areas. And the first one is your admissions counselor for financial aid, because you, when every school you apply to, you will have an admissions counselor assigned to you, usually based on geography. On geography. And in the 21st century, admissions counselors are financial aid experts. So you don't really have to go to the financial aid office to get good information. Most of my admissions counselors, as I'm sure uh, is the same with my colleagues on with me tonight, can answer probably 99% of the questions that you that you pose to them. And I had already mentioned that I just trained my, uh, one of my counselors today who's a rookie on financial aid. Um, so you, I, I just want to emphasize that you don't have to jump around a university. You can talk to your admissions counselor who's your advocate. They're trying to make it work for you. And we even discourage it. If it's not in your financial interest to come to Tampa, you know, we talk about possibly transferring. So they're not going to oversell you on a university that you can't afford. And then the second thing that I think is underutilized is your high school counselor. Because if you want to get frequently late in the process, people say, Brent, I know I got the scholarship from Tampa. I know I got this need-based aid, but what else is out there? And, and I find that they haven't asked their high school counselor because your best probability of getting a scholarship outside of a university is with local scholarships. And it's very hard to uncover those local scholarships because um, there's no one search engine. You know, the fast webs and the, some of those other resources we gave you will give you ones where you may have 10,000 or 50,000 competitors. But if you look locally, you may have, you know, 19 competitors. And I'm gonna, I want to use my youngest son because he was, none of my kids got outside scholarships except my youngest son. And he was a master at it. And what he did, he went to his high school counselor and he said, Mrs. Hacker, you know, are there any other scholarships? And she told him about this dentist, this local dentist who gave three $1,500 scholarships for kids who did community service. So boom, he got 1,500. And he was also a very good track runner. And she said, there's this shoe store that also gives uh, to the local high schools a $1,000 scholarship. If you write an essay, boom, he got that one. He got another one uh, called Heart of a Champion Award, similar. And then he got one other one that I can't even remember. But he got all of these by asking his high school counselor. They're experts. They know what's there in the community. And you'd much rather have, you know, 15 to 20 people competing for the scholarship versus, you know, 15,000. So those are two resources that I think are underutilized. Your admissions counselor where you apply and your good old high school counselor. Thanks so much, Brent. 
Um, so thank you so much to our, our panelists for your tips. Um, and it seems that many of you have been submitting questions in the Q&A. Um, so we're gonna take the remaining time, about 25 minutes to actually do some of those live uh, Q&A questions. Uh, but before I, I move on, because I know uh, a few of you all uh, weren't able to join us until a little bit later, um, just so you all know, once again, the reason why these schools are together um, are because they are a part of the Coalition for College, uh, which is made up of over 150 schools that are dedicated to affordability, access, and success. Um, you can actually start your My Coalition uh, profile and account early, as early as ninth, ninth grade. Um, so you'll be able to have access to that free locker space uh, that's unlimited where you can put everything and kind of chronicle your journey throughout high school, um, as well as having a college list, sharing that with a mentor, advisor, counselor, um, anyone like, like, like that. So um, thank you all so much. And we're gonna go ahead and jump into some of the live Q&A. So um, it looks like there is a question about completing the FAFSA. And the question is, is there a benefit in completing the FAFSA early? And I'll let Kelly take that one. Perfect. Um, there is a benefit to um, completing an early one. It's just great to get it checked off the list. You don't want to be worrying um, late into your senior year when you have a lot more going on. So it's really great to just get it done um, and get it out of the way. And there are certain types of aid that if you don't file by a particular deadline, um, that, that those funds no longer become available. Um, some are institutional, so if you have a limited amount of institutional grant um, and you file that fast for late, some of that money could run out. So we always recommend to our students, please just fill it out as soon as possible so you do not potentially lose out on any of the funding sources that we talked about here tonight. And Derek, I would actually add to that great answer from Kelly. Surprisingly, there are even merit outside scholarships that want to see a FAFSA on record. So even if you know, even by doing the, the, you know, the net price calculator I talked about earlier for the institution that you're not going to qualify for any aid from that institution, you may find that some merit scholarships may ask you to still have that on record. So just be, be good about filling out at least the one time before your freshman year. So that was actually a great segue into the next question. Um, one of the, the students asked, if they receive an outside scholarship or grant, uh, will that affect their financial aid from the institution that they're attending? And I'm just gonna let any of you all unmute and go ahead and answer that one. Will I get in trouble if I answer it, what I honestly did? Well, I'm gonna use my son as an example because he ended up coming to the University of Tampa and I said, don't tell anybody that you got an outside scholarship. But I probably shouldn't have done that. But um, he actually, so it just depends on the type of scholarship because some scholarships will pay the university and it could affect your, your need. Now, the university doesn't know about a lot of outside scholarships. He, uh, most of his scholarships were paid directly to him except one. And um, so where it could affect you now, since his dad worked for University of Tampa, he wasn't able to get need-based aid. But I, I wanna also emphasize almost many, if not most, all of the coalition schools give significant amounts of need-based aid. And what that means is if we look at your FAFSA and your EFC, and even if you aren't eligible for federal aid, you could be eligible for need-based aid. $25 million we give in need-based aid at University of Tampa. And it pains me that so many families don't complete the FAFSA. But that's where it typically will affect, or, or per, perhaps an athletic scholarship or a departmental scholarship could, uh, you know, there's certain formulas and metrics and guidelines that we have to follow. And that's where it could affect, uh, an outside scholarship could definitely reduce your amount of institutional or need-based aid. But luckily in my son's case, he wasn't getting any. Um, so there's, there's actually a sort of related question too that I, I'll, I'll throw out there as well. Um, somebody did ask if a student uh, has savings, can the student savings work against them in terms of receiving grants or financial aid? So I'll jump in there, Derek. So basically when we talked about the expected family contribution. We say family because it does include the parents' assets as well as the applicant, the student that's applying to school. 
So all your family's assets will be considered through the process of determining your financial need. So just keep that in mind and that will come if you as a student have enough assets where you get benefits from interest dividend income or you've worked jobs before you applied to college and you have money and you have to file taxes for that, you'll be asked to submit your tax information along with your parents' tax information as well. Thank can you. I just give a quick can I just give a quick example? I had an interesting situation of two twins last year and one of them worked at some department store JC Penney or something like that and the other twin did babysitting jobs over the summer where she was paid cash. So here I had two twins from the same family and yet they had very different EFCs because one of the uh, young ladies you know had uh, you know, documented information by the federal government of how much she made and the other one didn't. So uh, it can even work like that. Okay, great. Um, so one other question that came in um, is about the FAFSA and about financial situation. So um, if a student or the family's financial situation changes, uh, but the FAFSA looks at the tax return from a year or two years ago with prior prior, um, what should they, they do? How should they address that uh, when the financial situation has changed sort of drastically? I, I can take that or at least uh, start. Um, we have a process that we call it special circumstances um, where your FAFSA might show one thing, but in particular in this, this COVID environment, um, they, things have changed drastically, especially since people filed their, their 2019 tax return. So um, we do suggest you reach out to the financial aid offices to at least, um, that's the way we do it here at, here at the University of Pittsburgh. And they will probably ask for documentation, you know, although we, we definitely believe everybody who calls us, we, we do need that documentation to, to check that out. Um, and, and sometimes we, we had a lot of families ask shortly after a parent maybe lost a job. Um, and we said to them, an immediate loss of job does not change a whole year's tax return. We need to truly understand, is this a short term um, job loss or is this going to be kind of a long term thing that will drastically affect your financial situation. So my advice to to students and family is to reach out and ask um, because I, I believe everyone's process is slightly different, um, but this is a case where it certainly doesn't hurt to ask. And Jared, national disasters can also be uh, uh, special circumstances. Do you anticipate, since you were at a California school, are you anticipating uh, quite a bit of appeals in that regard? We've already started seeing them. So students who just started this fall, like literally Tuesday was our first day of our fall term, we're already having students who just started and their family has lost everything or income at least. And we will certainly start making revisions right away to support those situations. Thank you. Um, so this is a, a question that kind of goes to, to all of you all because it might be different. I, I think it might be similar though at, at all of them, but um, if your college provides a package of grant awards, scholarships, loans, um, can you accept some of the package or do you have to accept it all? How does that, that process work? I'll go ahead and let Mary take that one. Yeah, so that is what is being offered by the institution, but it's not anything you are obligated to do. So, um, you know, you the college might say, hey, we're giving you $3,000 worth of student loans, um, but you don't want to do that. You're still responsible for, you know, paying that uh, full expected family contribution and, and finding a way to, to, to make that bill. But if, if those $3,000 worth of student loans are not something that you want to do and you have another option for, for that amount, you know, that's totally within your rights. This is what we're offering, but it's, you don't have to accept the whole thing, not at all. Great. And I, would, I would also offer, Derek, you know, when you see that offer of the financial aid, some, in some cases, a student might feel they can work a little bit more work study. And we'll ask if they can actually adjust their loan amount if that's applicable for their situation. Now, we as college administrators don't want to recommend that you take on 40 hours of work. 
But you know, if you want to go from eight hours per week to 10 to 12 hours per week, that might be feasible. And you could see some adjustments made to your loan if that's possible. Great. So, so, so that actually goes into another question that was asked. Um, when a student is awarded work study, do they get to keep the money from the work study job or does the university or college keep it? If you are working a federal work study job or a standard campus work study job, that's your money that you are earning. So that goes directly into your pocket to help pay for typically what's called indirect costs or charges. So things like books and supplies and food on the weekend with your friends, you know, anything that's not necessarily being charged directly by the Institute, you can have that spending cash throughout the semester or term to help pay for those items. Okay, and another question that, that came in was, how will, they, how will a student or a family know that a college they're applying to is need blind? Um, and then can, can you explain once again, the difference between subsidized and unsubsidized loans? And I guess I'll, I'll throw that to Mary since Mary explained it earlier. Sure, um, so, so two parts of that. So knowing about, and this was something Kelly talked about, um, the need blind, it, that's really an admission policy, but as she said, that definitely relates to financial aid. Um, and that's just something, that's something that many schools, especially if they have a need blind admission policy that uh, they're very proud of. And so they'll often let you know about that upfront. Um, but you should always feel free to ask that um, whether or not a school is need blind in their admission process and that question that I mentioned, whether or not a school is meeting full financial aid. I think need blind admission is, is a wonderful benefit for students. But the most important thing is that a school meets full financial need for students. Um, so I think those are two really important questions. And then to explain the difference between um, subsidized and unsubsidized student loans, these are both um, federal student loans, but subsidized loans are based on a family's financial need. So you have to qualify for those. And part of that is because there's this really nice benefit. Um, your loan will accrue interest, but while you were in school, the federal government is paying the interest on that loan. And then you have this nice grace period after you graduate, so you've got time to get a job and get your first paychecks before you start needing to make those payments. A subsid um, uh, sorry, an unsubsidized uh, federal student loan um, is not based on your financial needs. So anybody who completes the FAFSA uh, qualifies for that. Um, but the, the interest that accrues on that loan while you're in school still is your obligation. So you either need to pay the interest while you are in school or defer the interest and it will get wrapped into that total amount that you borrowed upon graduation that you'll be responsible for paying back. Um, but both of those subsidized and uns unsubsidized student loans have the benefit of having a fixed rate for the entire term of the loan. So that means that if you get an interest rates are really low right now, I don't know what, if any of my colleagues know what the federal student loan interest rate is, please feel free to chime in. But, um, you know, let's just say you've got a 3% student loan when you borrow that money, either subsidized or unsubsidized, you're going to keep that same rate the entire time. They can't change it uh, to be, you know, five or six percent as interest rates go up. You're going to keep that same rate the entire time. That means your payments will be consistent. Um, so that's another good benefit. We should also point out, Derek, the subsidized or unsubsidized loans are in the student's name, uh, whereas the parents may choose to take out what's called a parent plus loan, but that's based on their own assets and equity that's separate from the student's loans. Got it, perfect. Um, so there are a couple of questions about um, some specifics of the FAFSA as well as the CSS profile. So I'll go ahead and ask those a little bit together. Um, so there is one question that has to deal with the FAFSA and it's will a 529 have an impact on a FAFSA? And then the other question is um, how would you file the FAFSA if you have parents who are separated or, div or divorced? Do you always need both uh, custodial parents to give their information? And I'll pass it to Brent. I, I think 
Brent, you, you had uh, mentioned something earlier about the non-custodial parents. Um, no, that wasn't me, but I, uh, generally speaking, yes, you need both parents, but there are some circumstances. I think it was Kelly that was talking about that. There are some circumstances where, uh, you know, if it's a contentious divorce or something to that effect that, um, you know, that could put the student in danger of recontacting the parent, then there, there are ways to, uh, I haven't really worked with many appeals in that regard. Have you, Kelly? Um, we haven't. Uh, generally, we tell families it's best to have both um, parents fill out the FAFSA. We, we recently had a, um, a conversation, an internal conversation about um, divorced parents, and sometimes it's written into the divorce document. The, call, the custody switches every other year. So in those cases, it could be a different um, parent files one year and the other custodial parent will file the following year. Generally, they say whoever has the, the um, more than 50% of the custody that particular year needs, needs to file the FAFSA. Um, but they, we do recommend both parents um, supplying that information. Um, and I will say our executive director of financial aid is being so kind as to answering questions. So um, the, for the 529 um, question that you had asked, um, the balance of the 529 will come into play when you file your FAFSA. So that will um, ultimately affect both the, the um, expected family contribution and um, any unmet need that may, may come from that. Great, so we have a little over five, five minutes and a couple of extra questions here. So um, this one's a little easier. I guess, at what age does the parent income no longer influence student aid packages? Or is, is there an, an age? I actually have no idea, so. <laughs> 24. I, I, I have, I'm, very fortunate to have Randy here on speed dial. So he, he knows all these intricate details. So the age is 24. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. Um, and there, there was an additional question. I know that we sort of covered this about, you know, any natural disasters or, or, or really anything, but I think a lot of families, especially of seniors are very concerned about loss of income right now. Can you all tell us a little bit more about how your schools or how schools are going to take that into account with layoffs and everything that happened with the pandemic? I think the most important thing I think all of us would suggest is that we on the admission side of the house are just like the financial aid side of the house. We're real human beings who want to help and support our students go through this process. So in some cases, you might even find on the front page of a financial aid website, like a COVID related expense adjustments form or something along that, that situation to help give more updated information. Uh, as we talked already, the taxes that you've submitted for next year's information are already back a couple years worth. So it doesn't really give the relevant information what's happening now with COVID, with the West Coast fires, with earthquakes, with all kinds of scary things that are happening in our world. We wanna know about them and we wanna be able to support the students. But if we make any adjustments, just keep in mind the adjustments that we make, at some point we're gonna to wanna to validate the numbers you gave us, those estimates you gave us, so we can make sure we adjust it accordingly. And if we over adjusted, know that we might have to make other adjustments on the reverse side, depending on the situation. And colleagues, correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't it the trigger point? Unfortunately, you have to be unemployed for quite a while before uh, you know, you'll be considered for an appeal. Again, universities are often flexible, but typically it's four months. Is that the trigger point, about four months? Of, I know it's a long time to be unemployed, but. Great, right, thank you. Oh, I think Jared was gonna say something, no? Okay, great. Um, so one other uh, question, going back to the net price calculators, um, how accurate or how realistic are those estimates really? Um, and then should you use your, your income before or after deductions when you're doing them? I'm happy to jump in. I know Brent was singing the praises of the net price calculator and I will echo that. Um, but also to add, I think this is a really good question because um, Brent made clear that we, we put a lot of institutional investment into making sure those net price calculators are accurate. 
but they are only as accurate as the information that you put in. Um, and so uh, I, I, my kids are still elementary school age, so I haven't gone through this with my own kids, but for the sake of research, I did try to do this um, and it's involved. So, um, you know, I recommend that families, you get out your tax returns from last year, you got all your pay stubs, you got all your financial documents, and then sit down and do the net price calculator. I know it sounds like a lot of work, um, because it is, it's not going to take you five minutes to do it, um, but it will, it will result in a really accurate estimate. If your numbers are accurate, if you're taking those right from your tax returns, your pay stubs, your financial information, you can rest assured that the methodology on our side is accurate and you'll get a really good and accurate estimate there. Um, but do, do, you know, plan ahead to spend a little bit of time doing that, I would say. And I, because one of my kids really used a lot of different university net price calculators. And uh, I think where a lot of, I'm just going to tell you one area where a lot of people put mistakes, you need to read carefully whether it's weighted or unweighted GPA. That's a big mistake. Like here at Tampa, we look at unweighted GPA. So a lot, not a lot, but because it's, it's clear and red letters, you know unweighted, but sometimes people will put in weighted GPA and that's then you're going to get inaccurate information. And my, my daughter really liked it because she was in the process of, she was going to take, uh, she took the SAT and was going to take the ACT. And so she played around with the net price calculator once she got a pop in. She said, okay, well, if I get a, a 32 on my ACT, then what will it cost? So you can kind of play around. Once you populate it with most of the info, you can play around and then shoot for like, it's hard to change your GPA between your junior and senior year, but for uh, universities that are looking at test scores, you can really play around with it to, to see how your costs would change. So from a dad who's gone through it, that's what I recommend. And I, and I again, say, uh, I can't, I certainly can't say every university has an accurate net price calculator, but I bet most of the coalition uh, for college schools do because you know we're in the coalition for college because we have to meet certain metrics and i just want to add one thing the graduation rate we haven't spoken about can i add one quick thing derek if you go the fifth year if you don't graduate in four years and remember we all pride ourselves in graduating graduating students in four years that fifth year on average will cost the net cost will be fifty seven thousand dollars because on average, if you just go to a state university, I'm not even talking about private, state university, you're going to pay $12,000 in average tuition in the United States, but you're not going to be making the $45,000 your first year out of school that graduates make. So you add that forty five, dollars you're going to be making zero. So add that $45,000 with the $12,000 you're paying, that's a lot of money. $57,000 is what that fifth year will cost you. So that's the nice thing about coalition schools. We take this very seriously. We try to graduate students in four years. Thank you so much for that, Brent. Um, and one last last question I'm just gonna do by a show of hands. Um, how many of the schools here um, allow international students to be eligible for financial aid? Okay, great. And then how many schools here take the CSS profile? Okay. Awesome. All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up there. Thank you so much to our panelists um, for taking the time out um, to share all of your advice and your tips uh, with all the students and families. And thank you to the students and families for um, chatting in such great questions. Once again, if you have any questions, reach out to us at info at coalitionforcollege.org. And additionally, uh, really do follow us on, on Instagram, the Coalition for College. Um, there are articles and advice that are released every week um, that can help you uh, find schools that are affordable and that will do right by you, just like these great schools here. So thank you, everyone, and have a great night. Thank you.